I've been thinking about time And where does it go? How can I stop my life from passing me by? I don't know I've been thinking about family Now it's going so fast Will I wake up one morning Just wishing that I could go back I've been thinking about lately Maybe I can make a change and let it change me So with all of my heart This is my prayer Singing Oh Lord, keep me in the moment Help me live with my eyes wide open Cause I don't want to miss what you have for me Touch my heart Don't let me stray I just want to stay where you are All I got is one shot One try One go around in this beautiful life Nothing is wasted When everything's placed in your hands Singing Oh, Lord, keep me in the moment Help me live with my eyes wide open Cause I don't want to miss what you have promise you home so it's all eyes on you until the day you call me home singing oh lord keep me in the moment help me live with my eyes wide open cause i don't want to miss what you have for me i don't want to miss i don't want to miss singing oh lord show me what matters throw away what i'm chasing oh.
Good morning. <laughs> I am not David Beagley. <laughs> hey, but welcome. We're so glad you're here this morning. Uh, we're looking forward to a great time of worship. Uh, a couple things just to remind you about. Um, one, we have our membership meeting, a family meeting coming up on uh, March 28th. That was in the, uh, the church newsletter that went out and uh, the bulletin. We have a couple um, exciting announcements in regards to building and phase two and our church loan. We're also looking at a, a few things. Um, I got to revisit a topic on the Constitution that we talked about last time, but there are some exciting things happening uh, in the life of our church, so we would encourage everyone to be there, uh, but particularly as far as members, uh, we will do some voting things, so we would appreciate, uh, appreciate you be there. So uh, looking forward to a great time of worship this morning. Let's uh, have our grace dues for this day. Spring break is coming, and in Kids Ministries, we have some fun, exciting things happening. On Tuesday, the 23rd, we are having praise and paint event. Sign up your kid, and we will we will have praise time, and we also get to paint a cute little uh, silly sloth. Um, sign up for one of those. The cost is $6.50, but that takes care of the professional that's coming to um, lead our kids in the paint event. Another thing coming up is we have another ba kids' baptisms class. So if your kid has asked you any questions about baptism is questioning it i don't understand what what the what we believe this is a great class to do it's going to be on wednesday and thursday of spring break two hours each day and we go through a workbook and we go through all the different uh, aspects of our faith and what baptism actually means if you have any questions about these events give me a call or text me and i would be glad to answer those well, I want to remind you of our service times at 8, 9.30, and 11. And uh, during our 9.30 and 11, we have a children's ministry going on. And we are seeing an increase in attendance during those times for our kids, which is a great thing. Um, and so if you are able to attend an earlier service, if you don't have kids, um, and would like to attend the 8 o'clock service, there is room for you there. Uh, there is also room uh, at the 11 o'clock, so we want to make space during that 9.30 service. A lot of options for you to attend uh, those three services. Uh, we will be adding a few more seats during, uh, during each of those services in the sanctuary. Uh, but if you don't have any kids, uh, consider coming to the 8 o'clock or the 11 o'clock service. Thanks again for joining us this Sunday. We are so glad that you were here with us. If you want to give to the Ministries of Grace Church, make sure to use the giving envelopes and the seat backs. You can put them in the donation boxes on your way out. If you are a guest with us today, though, don't feel like you have to give. We're just glad that you joined us. Also, don't forget to download our Church Center app if you haven't already. Through that app, you can register for events and our services. You can also uh, get to our streaming page for the live stream. You can uh, see groups. You can give through the app. Everything with regards to our church now is being channeled through that app. So make sure to download it. Thanks again for being here. Have a great rest of your Sunday. All right, well, good morning. You guys are either well-rested or half awake, uh, depending on what time you came here. Uh, but we're so excited to be able to worship together as we do every week. Um, so would you stand with us as we sing out this song that um, we introduced last week, that we are more than conquerors, that, that through Christ uh, we have been redeemed, that we don't need to bow down to sin or to shame. And so let's sing. You are the fight that's in my soul. 
out this morning that how marvelous, how wonderful, and our song shall ever be that we want to sing about our Savior's love. And how marvelous, how wonderful that my song shall ever Shall 
It's so good to gather together to just sing praises to you. God, we thank you that we are more than conquerors through Christ, that you set us free, that we've been redeemed, uh, that you shed your blood on the cross for us. And so this morning, we just pray that we would just come with that posture of uh, just humbleness as we stand before you, Jesus, our King. God, just let us lay down our lives. We want to hear from you. And so we just pray that you would just speak through Sam today. God, that you would use every word that he says, that it would just deeply convict us, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We love you. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you and good morning to each and every one of you. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. And thank you for online folks for joining us as well. It's good to have you in attendance. And so it's a, a day of celebration and joy, extra joy that I stand before you uh, today because uh, this week, uh, Allison and I, uh, our first grandchild was born to us, uh, Katie and Jack. Uh, well, Callahan uh, Lee Lander was born, and so I have some pictures I'd like to show all. So, no, I, I won't take time. No, no, I don't have them there either. So, but anyway, so we're, we're especially excited, and uh, uh, even in the midst of everything that we've experienced this year, it's just uh, so wonderful to experience new life and new birth, and so, uh, so we, we celebrate in that. Um, Today, uh, we think about times in our lives when we act in such a way, thinking that uh, there will be no effect uh, that our actions bring to our spiritual lives. And we sometimes think we can be fully self-reliant and self-sufficient in meeting God's standards. But what happens to us uh, when we try to live according to our own self-sufficiency, that's what we're looking at today. I came across a story this week, and, and I, I want to share with you some of the, the salient points from that story as I read through it, uh, so, um, so bear with me as I uh, introduce it through this story. In February of last year, Michael Sexton read of a buried treasure in a book by an eccentric and car controversial art dealer. Uh, the art dealer claims he buried $2 million worth of gold coins and other artifacts somewhere in the Rocky Mountains and gives clues throughout the book. Uh, although thousands have gone looking for the buried box, no one has found it yet. And worse yet, four people have died trying to do so. However, uh, unlike the rest of them, Michael uh, knew where the treasure was. He was certain about it because of his interpretation of the clues in the book. So he talked a 65-year-old friend into joining him on, on this treasure hunt. Uh, they headed to Dinosaur National uh, Monument, on the Colorado-Utah border. Uh, Michael nor his partner were prepared for an overnight stay in the mountains, uh, assuming that they would be home that evening uh, two million dollars richer. Why not? Well, uh, Michael was wrong. <laughs> 
They uh, didn't find the treasure, and they lost their bearings. Uh, Shivering and close to death, they were fortunately found just in time by a search and rescue team who had uh, been called to look out for them. One would think that surviving such an experience uh, like that, that uh, a person might give up and say, well, I've I've, I've given it the best shot that I can. But not Michael, no. Uh, One month later, uh, having recovered uh, from his, uh, his injuries... Uh, he tried to give it another go. So he sweet-talked his 65-year-old friend into it again, and out they went on their next excursion. Um, And this time, they were sure to find it. Uh, They took a couple candy bars with them, a couple bottles of water, and, of course, a copy of the book following the clues. Uh, This time, they decided, however, to rent a couple snowmobiles uh, because the weather had turned a little bit, and they needed to get across the snow. So they headed to a rental uh, shop just outside the monument and rented the snowmobiles, Uh, put them in the truck, and took off on their adventure. And, uh, uh, but however, uh, as nightfall came, the the person who rented the the snowmobiles to these these two fellas, um, they hadn't returned the snowmobiles. And so he called the local authorities, uh, uh, asking if they could go look for them. So sure enough, the local authorities went out, and they went on again another search and rescue <laughs> mission to try and find Michael and his friend. Uh, they found the snowmobiles, but uh, the two gentlemen were nowhere to be found. And so uh, they did a little bit more searching, gave up on that Friday, and decided that they would take up the, the search the next day, still having not reco- or recovered them or found them. And so the next day, they did find uh, Michael and his friend uh, on, on the Saturday morning, uh, they found them, ironically, just a few, uh, few steps away from where they had gotten lost the last time. And so, so they found him there. So Michael did make it home this time, but this time in a body bag. He died due to the elements. And his 65-year-old friend refuses to talk about uh, the adventure uh, because of all the pain and all the suffering that he endured as a result of their foolishness. So what does that have to do with our sermon this morning? What's the point? Well, sometimes we do things that clearly demonstrate our over-reliance on ourselves. Uh, Too often we think more highly of our own abilities than we ought to. Uh, We think we don't need help from anyone. Uh, Maybe at at times in our spiritual lives we don't even need help from, from God. So today, as we work through our passage to the, the letter to the church at Laodicea, we want to focus on this central theme. This is our big idea for the day, that sufficiency in Christ must displace our self-sufficiency. Sufficiency in Christ must displace our self-sufficiency. So let us read this morning's passage with these thoughts in mind. Please turn to your Bibles with me uh, to Revelation 3, beginning in verse 14. And out of respect for God's word, I would ask you to join as we read uh, these words to the church at Laodicea. You join me. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed, and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. May we listen to the words that uh, Christ gives to the church at Laodicea. May they penetrate our heart as well. Uh, May they see those areas in our lives where we become self-sufficient, 
uh, depending on our own initiatives, our own ingenuity, and our own desires in a way that may possibly lead us into an encounter uh, that destroys us or takes us far away from our relationship with you. So guide us this day, we pray, by the authority of your word and the teaching of your scriptures. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. A little bit of background information as we've done throughout this series for, series for each of the, the seven churches. So Laodicea. So here's, here's the map. Uh, we've used the map each week and see uh, from the writing when John is exiled in Patmos as the letters make them way, their way through Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and all the way down to Laodicea. And so Laodicea, this is the last church that is written to these, uh, to these churches here. The city itself is about 40 miles um, east of Ephesus on the banks of the Lycus River. Uh, the city's name is taken from uh, Laodice, the wife of Antiochus II, who was the king of Syria, and uh, did some major rebuilding of the city uh, in, at this time in the first century. Significant ruins of the city include theaters, an aqueduct, a gymnasium, a council meeting house, and a stadium, and certainly a temple uh, dedicated to, to pagan deities. Uh, Laodicea was known for its wealth and manufacturing of a special eye ointment and uh, glossy black wool cloth. Uh, Laodicea it was also laid, located near Hierapolis, uh, where, where they were famous for their hot springs, and also Colossae, known for its pure cold water. However, Laodicean aqueduct water was lukewarm, uh, not like the hot water that came from Hierapolis or the cold water that came from Colossae. At one time, it was one of the most important and flourishing cities in Asia Minor. And at a very early period in Christian history, it was, in many respects, one of the chief seats of Christianity. Uh, the Apostle Paul had significant ministry in Laodicea, and he accounts this in his record to the church in the letter that he writes to the church in, in Colossae. In Colossians 2.1, the Apostle says these words, For I want you to know how greatly I am struggling for you, for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me in person. So the Apostle Paul encouraged that the letter written to the Colossian church be read also to the church in Laodicea. He had also written a letter to the church in Laodicea that he also wanted read to the church in Colossae. We see that in Colossians 4.16, where he says there again, this letter has been read at your gathering. Have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And while we have no record of this letter in our New Testament Bibles, uh, uh, some scholars believe this letter may have some tie to the letter that was actually written to the church in Ephesus. Uh, but at best, this too is, is a little bit speculation, uh, as we see. The letter, wherever it is, um, probably would have bared similar kind of theological particulars within the introduction of the letter, and then more pragmatic or, or practical kinds of encouragement to the church, which was common for Paul's letter to, to several churches. And we know now that Laodicea is a deserted place with only ruins of a bygone era. There's no established church whatsoever, just ruins. I wonder if that has something to say about the church. Well, let's see. Let's see. The first point we learned from our passage this morning is that Christ's sufficiency puts our self-sufficiency in proper perspective. Christ's sufficiency puts our self-sufficiency in proper perspective. Notice in verse 14 how Christ's sufficiency is established. It says there, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, thus says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. First, Jesus refers to himself here as the amen. We, we attach amen to the, to the conclusion of our prayers. Every pray that we, prayer that we offer, uh, we conclude by saying amen. And we, as many of us may know, that the word amen itself literally means so be it. We're acknowledging the fact of the prayers that we're offering. Let it be so. Amen can also refer to the sovereignty of God, which is both the cause and control behind human events. Uh, the Old Testament word amen uh, is used of words like certainty, truth, and verily. 
The Hebrew word is literally amen. Thus Christ established his sufficiency as the ultimate truth and the yes to all things. In every facet of daily life, we need to recognize where our truth and our certainty originates. It originates in the eternal amen. Secondly, Jesus refers to himself here as the faithful and the true witness. In speaking of himself as the faithful and true witness, Christ repeated what he had said earlier in chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 3, verse 7. He here again is making the same declaration about himself, more importantly to the Laodiceans, establishing his sufficiency as the ultimate and most credible witness. We cannot look to our fallen world or the values of the world to be our ultimate source for what is true. Instead, we need to remind ourselves and others, uh, for that matter, of the testimony and witness of the resurrection and the person of Christ. Jesus reminds us in his own words in John 8, 18, I am the one who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. The true and faithful witness himself. Third, Jesus establishes himself and his supremacy as referring to himself as the originator of God's creation. As the originator of God's creation, Christ existed before God's creation and is sovereign over it. A well-known passage in the New Testament comes out of the letter to the Colossian church. We see in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, these words. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him, for, through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. The phrase firstborn over creation has nothing to do with Christ as a created being, as many uh, cults and heresies have advocated throughout history. Instead, this significant saying, the firstborn of creation, is a clear declaration of Christ's supremacy over all things, even all things created. The supremacy of Christ over created things establishes his authority over the universe and our lives. His supremacy also reminded the Laodiceans of who he is in preparation for the stern words of rebuke he's about to give them. Similarly, we would do well to remind ourselves who is ultimately supreme and in control of everything, everything, not only the universe, but us as well. No governments, no political ideologies, no cultural perspectives, not even pandemic viruses or fires or ice storms can overcome the supremacy of Christ. Amen? Amen. We also see in verse 15 and 16, Laodicea's self-sufficiency exposed. Uh, Laodicea, by the way, is the only church of the seven that does not receive praise or commendation. Every one of the other six churches received at bare minimum some sort of praise or recognition for their patience, for their perseverance, or their acts of right living. Here, however, Jesus gets straight to the point. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Very graphic words that Jesus is using here. Both the cold water from Colossae and the hot water from Hierapolis uh, would be lukewarm, as we noted, by the time it was piped to Laodicea. And so hearing these words, these people at this church would have known what Jesus was making reference to, a clear connection to, to their setting and their context. In the Christian life, we recognize that there are three spiritual tempers, temperatures that we experience in our lives, three, three spiritual temperatures. The first type of temperature is those individuals who their hearts are hot for God. They're on fire for the Lord. The kind of passion we see demonstrated by those who at Pentecost received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as the gospel was preached to them. In Acts 2, 37, it says that when they heard this, 
They were cut to the inner core, cut to the quick, or cut to the heart, some translations say. And they said to the apostles and to one another, brothers, what should we do? And out of the hotness and the fire of their heart, hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ clearly declared to them, giving their lives completely over to Jesus, the hotness of their hearts turned them in to a people who were zealous for Jesus. And they clearly did, declared not only the gospel in Jerusalem, but carried it on to Judea, Samaria, and even the remotest parts of the world. I often tell my students in my classes, could you imagine if those people did nothing? If they acted complacently? If they didn't act at all? Where would we be? We may not even be here today in our church. Had they not taken on the fire and the zeal for the Lord, acting out of the hotness of their hearts to pursue the gospel and its purposes to the end of the earth. There's also those who have a cold heart. And we often see this in the New Testament as referring to those who in the last days either lose their zeal or walk away from the faith altogether for many reasons. Matthew 24, 12 reminds us, because of lawlessness and its multiplication, the love of many will grow cold. I have friends. I know former students I even know pastors, one in particular, who I went to seminary with who have walked away from their faith altogether. For whatever reasons, things have happened in their life in such a way that has brought them to a place where they just feel like it's, it's no longer worth it to carry on. People nowadays, it's very popular to deconstruct their faith and deconstruct it out of any kind of alliance or allegiance with the biblical or historical Christianity or any kind of allegiance to the authority of scriptures. And so they're cold. There's an old saying that uh, goes like this. Sitting in a church makes you no more a Christian than sitting in your garage makes you a car. Simply showing up doesn't get the job done. Just simply appearing and checking off an attendance record doesn't make it happen. So the question becomes, um, where is the coldness in our hearts? Where do we go? The lukewarm Christian is comfortable, they're complacent, and they may not realize their need for an abiding connection to Christ and his sufficiency. The irony is that even if people were cold, at least they would know they're cold. Uh, and so we see that. And so, but this lukewarmness is brought on uh, for a lack of, of, of staying with it and, and, and continuing on. And so we need to ask ourselves if we have the same kind of lukewarmness in our lives. And so the answer has to do, in part, as we see from the text, where did this lukewarmness came, come from? It came from their riches, their excessive focus on their wealth. Verse 17 says, like a lot of New Testament passages, it warns us about keeping our focus on riches. It says, therefore, it says, I am rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. We want to be careful here because riches in this context do not always imply money. Being rich certainly can relate to our bank accounts. Uh, but it can also relate to those areas of our life where we delude ourselves into thinking that we have great wealth. For some of us, it may be in relation to our position. We have pride in achieving a certain level of status or power or influence. Some of us may think that we're rich in regard to prestige, a pride from the esteem and glamour sought and won from others. Some of us may think that we're rich in respect to our property, the things that we own, amassing homes, cars, clothing, recreational equipment, toys, more screens. Do we need one more screen in our life? And yes, oftentimes we even see ourselves as being rich in respect to people, other people. A sense of pride in having many friends. Come on, seriously. Are Facebook friends really friends? But we pride ourselves on these things. Think about it. The Laodiceans were comparatively rich. Listen to this. They were famous and well-known for their banking system. They were famous and well-known for their hot springs. They were famous and well-known for their optometry hospital. They were famous and well-known for their sports complex. 
Uh, isn't Laodicea the kind of place that you'd like to live or at least vacation in? Yeah. But for the Laodiceans, their lukewarm attitude resulted in their overconfidence in their wealth and their riches. Riches and affluence often lead to a posture of self-sufficiency. They oftentimes delude us into thinking that we have everything apart from needing anything, uh, anything else. Or someone else, namely Jesus, to be the center of our lives. I like this saying that Kenneth Boa uh, talks about in his book, Conform to His Image. He says this, This is evident in the tragedy of many people who in the first half of their lives spend their health looking for wealth, and in the last half spend their wealth looking for health. Isn't that how, that's ironic. Why do we do that? So the trappings of riches lead to a warning not only to the Laodiceans, but to us today. Look specifically at the words of criticism by Jesus to this church. You are wretched, implying one being miserable, unfortunate, a word used of ravaged lands, devastated countries, and pillaging. You are pitiful, one who is viewed as looked down upon and pitiable, the object of extreme pity. You are poor, speaks to their extreme poverty, like a beggar or a pauper, a slap at the city who bragged about its wealth, its commerce, its banking industry. You are blind, that's a dig at a city that prided itself on its optical school and famous for a G and I medicine. And you're naked, ridicule of a city that boasted of its famous glossy black wool. Now, let me insert a disclaimer here at this point. This does not mean we should not be good stewards of our finances and our wealth. The Bible certainly speaks extensively to being financially responsible. The point here, however, is that one cannot place their sufficiency in position, in prestige, property, or people. The answer instead is to find contentment. Contentment in following the Lord Jesus Christ in every endeavor of life. Lest we forget, Job 1.21 reminds us that naked we came into the world and naked we leave. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Philippians 4.11-12 through 12 says, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little. I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. The words of the great apostle. In 1 Timothy 6, 7 through 10, uh, Paul also reminds us of this, that godliness with contentment is great gain. For we, were bought and we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of it. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Sound familiar? Sound like the Laodiceans? And let's also be cautious that having riches and wealth is not the root of all evil, no, but it certainly can lure one into a sense of self-sufficiency and not looking to Christ to meet our every need. So we need the corrective of Christ's sufficiency, putting our self-sufficiency in its proper place. Our second point we make from our passage today is that we recognize Christ's sufficiency in moving us toward a repentant posture. Notice verses 18 and 19, I'd advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be zealous and repentant. As Pastor Dave noted a few uh, sermons ago that repentance is this posture we move away from something else we turn in a different direction and move towards something that is better for us biblical repentance always reminds us to turn away from those things that keep us from our relationship with God and others towards the things that God would have us to follow in his will and according to his way Part of a repentant posture here involves turning away from our self-sufficiency in our righteousness to the one who is righteous. 
Jesus asked the Laodiceans to turn away from the worldly based understanding of relying on riches to the true source of riches. Notice what Jesus asked them to buy. He asked them to buy refined gold. They were urged not to buy ordinary gold, but refined gold, referring to that which would glorify God and make them truly rich. Through its banking industry, the city had material wealth, something that they were quite proud of, but the church lacked spiritual richness, a sincere devotion and focus on Christ as all they could ever want and need. Would we or can we recognize the spiritual richness of being a Christ follower? Or are there other things competing for our attention? Work and tasks always needing to be accomplished. A tendency to give in time and again to the tyranny of the urgent. Marriage and family relationships that are left begging for our attention. Spouses who need their husbands to love them as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Children who desperately need to be trained up in the way that they should go. Not the way that they would go or could go, but the way that they should go. Living for Christ in such a way that co-workers, neighbors, and friends recognize the depths of the riches that we have in Jesus Christ. That's the kinds of riches that Christ wants us to buy from him. The gold refined by fire. Jesus also asked them to buy white garments. Though they had beautiful clothes, they were urged to wear white clothes, which according to the Bible is symbolic of righteousness, which would cover their spiritual nakedness. As wool was a primary product of the area, Laodicea was especially famous for its black garment made from wool that we mentioned earlier. Instead of relying on their covering of self-sufficiency, they needed to put on the pure white clothing of a life committed to Jesus Christ. Would we or can we recognize the abundance of the righteousness that Christ clothes us with? Or are there things getting in the way of understanding a right relationship before the Lord? Do we dwell on things that tend to puff us up? Do we lose a sense of who we are and our identity in Christ through the hurts and the pains we've experienced? Do we recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no shifting shadow? All that we have and all that we will ever receive is provided to us by the sovereign providential hand of God. Again, living for Christ in such a way that those around us can see that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Jesus also asked them to buy eye ointment, symbolizing spiritual sight. Uh, a medical school was located in Laodicea at the Temple of Asipolis, uh, which offered a special salve to heal common eye problems and troubles in the Middle East. What they needed was not this medicine. What they needed was spiritual sight. Would we or can we recognize the spiritual vision Christ bestows on us as we grow in our knowledge and our wisdom of, the, of His life in us? The church at Laodicea is typical of some modern churches unconscious of their spiritual blindness. Some churches are content with just their beautiful buildings and all the material things that their programs can provide. If you don't believe me, just turn on your TV to a Christian TV channel to see what I'm talking about. Again, the message here does not speak against the building of churches or capital campaigns, but rather being good stewards of the Lord's resources. Instead, it's an appeal to turn away from our self-sufficiency. Christ is not only the ultimate and complete owner of riches, clothing, and ointment, but he is the grand giver of such benefits to the repentant child of God. Thus, Christ needed to rebuke them because of his great love for them. We also notice that to obtain these riches, to be clothed in righteousness and receive spiritual sight from the Lord, we have to sometimes receive correction and discipline. Verse 19 says, as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. I know it may be hard to believe, but when I was a child, I was not the most obedient child. I was disobedient. 
and my mother and my father brought correction into my life because they loved me. Uh, one time in particular, I kind of got back to my parents. I, I got back at them. Um, I was well known at the dinner table for using my hands to eat with rather than the utensils that were provided by my mother. And this irritated my dad especially because I would be down in the plate using my hand. You have a, you have a child like this? Were you there? So in a fit of frustration and an opportunity to correct that behavior, my dad uh, instituted this policy at one of the evening meals. He said, Sammy, put your left hand on the table. So I did. Now take your spoon and put it on that left hand. So I sat the spoon on the left hand. So for the rest of the meal, for the rest of the meal, I don't want to see that spoon move. And I want you to use the proper utensil. What my dad forgot, to, forgot was is that we were having steak at that evening meal. <laughs> How does one cut their steak without using both hands? My hands pinned to the table with a spoon on top of it. So what I did in an act of ingenuity was put my fork in my mouth, stab it into the steak, and then use my free hand to cut the steak. <laughs> oh, how clever I am. My dad started laughing and said, ah, good one. You got me and everybody else around the table laughed. And, and I got one over on him that day, but not other days. So it may have been fun. So in the same way, the Lord brings discipline into our lives for good. Proverbs 3, 11 through 12 says, do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as the father disciplines his son in whom he delights. I pray my mom and my dad delight in me. I pray your moms and dads delight in you, and you delight in your children. And notice what the author of Hebrews has to say about discipline. In Hebrews 12, 9 through 11, it says, Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us, and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them, but he does it for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Discipline always leads us in repentance away from something towards something that God would have for us that's so much better for us. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. It's painful oftentimes, but it's necessary. It should also be noted that according to the Scriptures, the goal of biblical discipline is always, always, always restoration, not rejection. The goal is to restore the person first and foremost to the relationship with God. And in the context, oftentimes, when church have to, churches have to exact discipline on, on their members, is to restore that individual not only back to relationship with God, but relationship with one another. So the goal of biblical discipline, whether it's in our homes or here in our church, is always restoration, not rejection. Christ's discipline of the church at Laodicea was a call to lead them back through zealous repentance to the Lord, the opposite of being lukewarm. Christ disciplines his church and the followers of his church for their ultimate good and righteousness. So if you're here today wondering if your sin and your failure before God are so big he cannot forgive you, you need to hear the words offered here. The Lord is fully willing and capable of forgiving you and your sin. He's fully capable of restoring a right relationship between you and him. The Lord is also fully capable of healing and restoring the broken relationship that you have between yourself and others. The most straightforward remedy for a restored relationship between God and us and between us and others is plainly stated in Jesus' words here, be zealous and repent. So we recognize that Christ's sufficiency should move us towards repentant postures. Finally, we see in our passage today that Christ's sufficiency, sufficiency entirely accepted results in eternal prominence. 
Christ's sufficiency entirely accepted results in eternal prominence. Verses 22, 20 through 22 read this way. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear, ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. A few remarks about the door of one's heart. We often use these verses when we're attempting to lead lost people to saving faith in Christ, but the emphasis here is not to unbelievers, but to believers. If you're here today and you have not yet made a decision for Jesus Christ, there certainly is opportunity to do so. Uh, Our prayer team, you'll recognize them with the orange lanyards around their necks. They would love to meet with you after the service and pray for you and talk to you about how you can have a relationship with Jesus. If you're joining us online, there is an option for you to, to click on in the online format where others will be there as well to talk and pray for you. But let us remind ourselves that the seven letters we've considered over the past few weeks were written to local churches. However, in some instances, a word of praise or warning or correction is given to individuals who together make up those congregations. And looking back, we see this example in Christ's words to the church at Sardis. If you look in chapter 3 where we're at, at verses 4 and 5, we see these words. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and uh, and, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels." So, we see the general exhortations of each letter applied equally to both individuals and to churches. This is precisely what we see the Lord doing here in in His message to the Laodicean church. He spoke to the individual by saying, if anyone, part of the larger message, not only to individuals, but the entire congregation. So, we see the Lord is patient and waiting for a response from within by individuals, but also by churches. And let's also notice that he'll not knock down the door by force. It's the choice of the individual. I like what A.R. Fawcett says here. He says, for man is not compelled by irresistible force. Christ knocks, but he does not break open the door. Whoever does here does so not of himself, but by the drawings of God's grace. Repentance is Christ's gift. He draws, he does not drag. He draws, he does not drag. Christ most often knocks through the circumstances of our life as well as he calls us through his word, the Holy Scriptures. Uh, The Laodiceans were an independent church that needed nothing, but they were not abiding in Christ and drawing on their power from him. They had seemingly successful church programs, but it was not the fruit that was coming from abiding in Christ. Christ often calls out to individuals when the church is not listening. So what should I say to this or what should we say to this? It begs the question, how am I living for Christ within the body of believers whom I worship, fellowship, learn, and serve alongside with? Is the door of your heart open to the receptivity of Christ's lordship in both your personal and corporate experiences of faith? Do others in the company of our gathering recognize the indelible imprint of Christ's life on yours? Would the church notice if your spiritual gifts and abilities were not utilized for service in this church? Have you shut the door of your heart towards others out of hurt, anger, or pride? Have you slammed the door of your heart in rebellion against God because of ongoing unrepentant sin? Is Christ welcome in every corner of our lives, even in the most mundane and ordinary areas? If answering these questions in the positive has given you pause for thought, then today is a day to reopen the door of your heart to the living God. As the author of Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews 3.12, watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be any of you in any of you evil, an unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. And notice, too, what the Lord is calling us toward, and and, and to which? Fellowship and communion. He's inviting us to join him at the seat of his eternal banquet. 
The second half of verse 20 says, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. With Christ on the outside, there can be no fellowship nor genuine relationship. However, with Christ on the inside, there's wonderful fellowship and a sharing of the marvelous riches, clothing, and relationship with a holy God. This too raises the critical question concerning the extent of our intimate relationship with Jesus. We also hear, see here in verse 21 that those who are willing to repent of their self-sufficiency and open the door of their heart to their Lord and Savior, there's not only the promise of sitting at the table of his eternal banquet, but promise of ruling with him in his forever kingdom. Those whom Christ had just beforehand threatened to vomit out of his mouth, he now offers a seat to them on his throne. And notice there's two thrones here. Verse 21 says, To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. His, father throne, his father's throne is where he now sits at the right hand and has sat since his ascension after his victory over death, sin, the world, and Satan. As a glorified son of man, his throne will be set over the whole world at his second coming. Every believer who overcomes by keeping Christ's work until the end of this earthly life is given the promise to rule with Christ forever. Just as Jesus was obedient to the end of his earthly life and was rewarded with a share in his Father's throne, he promises those who overcome a share of his eternal throne. This is a pure longing and desire on our part to hear the words from our Lord and Master, well done, good and faithful servant. It's what the Apostle Paul speaks of in Romans 8, 16 through 17. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. In 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. He is calling us to live in the here and now in light of the yet to come. In the closing words to the church at Laodicea, we hear these these words. Let anyone who has ears to listen, uh, excuse me, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to his churches. Throughout this entire series, you've noticed that each of the seven churches received the same challenge to overcome and hear. The same charge is heard elsewhere in the New Testament, Matthew 13, 43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Let anyone who has ears listen. In our Lord's own words in Luke 8, 8, still other seed fell on the good ground. When it grew up, it produced fruit, a hundred times what was sown. As he said this, he called out, let anyone who has ears to hear listen. The challenge today is a simple one. Will we overcome? And will we listen? It's that simple. Will we live on fire for the Lord rather than being cold or lukewarm? And will we just simply listen? Jesus may be knocking at the door of your heart today. Today may bring about a need to re-examine our lives in light of living within our own self-sufficiency. I don't believe any person present today wants to end up like the Laodiceans, being disciplined and judged for, judged for a lack of zeal and our lukewarm life uh, in Christ. So sufficiency in Christ must displace our, our, our own self-sufficiency. And as we come to acknowledge this, we learn these three things that we've learned from our text. That Christ's sufficiency puts our self-sufficiency in proper perspective. Christ's sufficiency should move us toward a repentant posture. And lastly, Christ's sufficiency entirely accepted results in eternal prominence. Maybe we'd be on fire for the Lord as he would have us to be. Let's conclude our time in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the message of your word. 
Uh, We thank you, Jesus, for offering words to the Laodicean church that resonate within our own lives and with our church experience here today. We pray that you would help us be the kind of people that uh, are zealous and desirous of repenting and turning from our ways so that we can overcome and that we might listen to the Spirit who indwells and abides within us in a way that we're, we're open to his prompting and his leadings the way in which he convicts us and he calls us into a repentant posture to restore us right and, and, new, and new to you. So we just pray uh, that as we um, move throughout to the next days and the next weeks in our future lives that we would be overcomers, that we would listen to your word and, and the truth of your word. Help us to be engaged with one another in such a way that when they see us, they can see the richness that we have in Christ, that we're clothed in, in righteousness, and that, uh, that we see with spiritual insight in a way that helps others come to saving faith in Christ and, uh, and draws them into a deeper, maturing relationship. To this end, we thank you for our time in your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to respond to that message today as we sing uh, this Irish hymn, Be Thou My Vision, that that would be uh, the prayer of our heart, that we would keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Maybe we've been chasing after uh, things in this world, and this morning as we sing this song, that we would say, no, Lord, I want you to be my vision, that I would repent, that I would turn back to you, uh, that it's only you, Jesus, that I need. And so let's stand together as we sing.
still be my vision. God, we come before you today. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the high king, that you are the ruler over, over all creation. So God, just give us that perspective, give us that posture as we think about those words that were shared today, that we need to be dependent on you, Lord. And so we just lay down our lives before you. We give you control of, of everything. Our, our, our finances, our, our time, everything in our schedule, our relationships, Lord, we just lay those down at your feet. We know that we have been crucified with Christ, that we no longer live, that it's you living in us, it's you living through us. So as we sing this last song, God, we want this to be our prayer, that we would lay ourselves down on your altar, Lord, that we would be a living sacrifice to you. Name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing that out, that we would uh, just sing, lay me down, that I'm not my, my own no longer, um, that we would let go of our pride, that we would give up our rights, we would say, Jesus, take my life. Yo no. 
God is good, amen? God is good. We lay our lives down before him. We trust in the sufficiency of Christ, not in our own sufficiency. And uh, we are a church about worshiping God by making disciples. And we can only do that by relying on Christ. So as you go from this place, uh, go and make disciples. Uh, also want to let you know, if you are new to Grace, uh, make sure to go back to our Connections booth in the back. We have a gift for you as well as some information about our church. And uh, don't forget to check in on the Church Center app uh, if you are in attendance today to let us know that you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your Sunday. God bless. I used to live like I was under attack, dodging arrows from my past. I had no hope for tomorrow. Felt so much pressure, yes, I thought I would crack. But now there's no looking back. I'm moving forward, cause I know I got my armor now. No fear, no doubt, can't shoot me down yet. Yeah. I got my armor now. No fear, no doubt, gonna shoot me down, 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 down now. This whole thing under control My soul is untouchable Because you've already won me My victory is not in this flesh and bone It's in the cross and I know